much for joining us online as we worship the Lord together. We invite you to sing wherever you may be. Sing and worship with your families this morning as we give Him praise. Sing this dry and desert land. This dry and desert land, I tell myself keep walking on. Something up ahead, water falling like a song. An everlasting stream, the river carries me home. Let it flow, let it flow.
Welcome to North River Church Online. We are so glad you have chosen to worship with us today. Over the next few minutes, we will have an opportunity to worship through singing and through time in God's Word. As we gather together, we want to be mindful of those in our church family serving on the front lines as healthcare professionals, first responders, and essential service providers. Thank you so much for what you do. Please know your church family loves you and we are here praying for you specifically during this season. If you are interested and able to support the ministry of North River Church, you can give through our website, gonorthriver.org slash give or by texting NRC and the amount to 73256. We know that some in our church family or community may be in need during this season of uncertainty and we would love to come alongside you to help. If that is you, please fill out the form available on our website, gonorthriver.org slash help, and we will be in touch. Lastly, we are so excited to see the work being done on our church property, and we are about $700,000 away from walking into our new building debt-free. The end of April marks the end of our three-year Beyond campaign, and if you need information regarding your commitment or a statement, please reach out to the church office. Thank you for your faithful giving, and please continue praying that we can be debt-free upon completion of the church building. Thanks again for joining us, and let's continue to worship.
I want to invite you to go ahead and grab your copy of God's Word this morning and join me once again in Acts chapter 9. We're going to pick up where we left off this past week, this past Easter Sunday in our series as we've been walking our way through the book of Acts. We're going to pick up today in Acts chapter 9 verses 23 through verse 31. The message is entitled, A Word of Encouragement. And I hope for you this morning that this is a word of encouragement to you. Let's look at what Luke writes beginning in Acts chapter 9, verse 23. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him, but his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Father, we ask this morning that you would open our eyes, that we would be able to see, that you would open our ears, that we would be able to hear, and that you would open our hearts and our minds, that we would be ready to respond to your word and to your spirit. We ask all of this in Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. You know, we left off last week seeing Saul's conversion. That's Saul, who would later become the Apostle Paul. He had sought to kill Christians, sought to imprison them, had traveled from Jerusalem to Damascus, and he met Jesus on that Damascus road, that Easter road that we talked about last week. And on the back end of that, after he had trusted in Jesus Christ as his Savior, we saw that he began proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, what had transformed his life. He began sharing with others in the hope that it would transform their lives. But as we pick up today, what we're going to see is things turn just a little bit, that for Saul, he has been proclaiming the gospel, and those that he's been proclaiming it to, many had responded in faith, had trusted in Jesus as their Savior, but many of the devout Jews did not want to see him continue, and so they developed a plot to kill Saul. And so that's where we pick up as we look in verse 23. If you're taking notes this morning, I want you to write down this main idea. It's going to frame our time together today. We often underestimate the incredible impact an encourager can have. We often underestimate the incredible impact an encourager can have. We're going to see an encourager show up in the text here in just a little bit, but as we're walking through, here's the first truth I want you to see that we find in the text is that Saul's life was preserved. Look with me beginning in verse 23. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. That's to kill Saul. He had been proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. It had transformed his life. He was seeking to share with others the gospel of Jesus so it could transform their lives. But the devout Jews, which he used to be until he became a Christian, they didn't like this at all. And so they are doing everything they can to develop a plot to kill Saul. We saw that in verse 23, but in verse 24, their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. 
So in this moment for Saul, he hears word that there are those who are seeking to kill him. I want you to notice that that's exactly the same thing that he was trying to do with others. Remember at the end of chapter 7, we saw that he was present. In the first part of chapter 8, he was even holding the cloaks of those who were stoning Stephen. And he was zealous for the Lord's thinking that he was following the plan of God and stamping out this new sect, this Christianity, this worship of Jesus Christ as the Savior. But what happens is his life is transformed by the gospel, and then he begins to proclaim the good news of the gospel. So he goes from being a persecutor to one who is proclaiming. And Those who he would have identified himself with prior to his conversion look and say, we've got to stamp this out. Saul, who is now proclaiming the gospel, we need to put an end to this. We need to kill him. And so this plot is hatched. It's developed. And evidently they had a leaker among them because it spread out and word got to Saul. And so his disciples, those who had trusted in Jesus Christ, who were listening to his teachings, figured out we need to get him out of the city of Damascus. And so they lowered him into in a basket and put him down on the outside of the wall. So his life in this moment is preserved. And I want you to notice it continues on. Not only is Saul's life preserved, but Saul's transformation was promoted. And this is where the encourager comes into play in our text This morning. Look in verse 26 when he had come to Jerusalem. And I want you to take note that Saul had left Jerusalem at the beginning of chapter 8 with these letters to the synagogues in Damascus. He was going to stamp out Christianity. He met Jesus on that road and his life was transformed. And this is the first time that he is going back to Jerusalem, not as a Christian persecutor, but as one who is trusted in Jesus Christ as his Savior. And so he is on the way back to Jerusalem. We find out later in his letters that he's written, specifically at the end of Galatians chapter 1, that three years have passed since he left Jerusalem, since he met Jesus on that Damascus road, since he began preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in the area of Damascus. He had spent some time in the desert by himself studying the scriptures, and it's the first time he's going back to Jerusalem. He attempted, as he went back, the scripture says, to join the disciples. They were all afraid of him because they did not believe that he was a disciple. Much like the response of Ananias earlier in the chapter after the Lord comes to him and says, I want you to go and find Saul. The believers who are in Jerusalem, they know who Saul is. In fact, three years prior to this, they knew that he was the one who was sending out and seeking to stamp out Christianity. But now, all of a sudden, he's back in Jerusalem after a three-year hiatus, and he is seeking to join the very group that he was persecuting when he left. They didn't believe he was a disciple. They were questioning that. They were not wanting to let him into the circle. But I want you to notice in verse 27, Barnabas. We met Barnabas earlier in the scriptures in Acts chapter 4. We saw that he was the son of encouragement, that he was one who early on in the life of the church had taken his possession of a field and sold that and gave the money to the church there in Jerusalem. Barnabas comes along as Saul is trying to join this group of believers in Jerusalem. And Barnabas took Saul. He brought him to the apostles and he declared to them how on the road he, that's Saul, had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of the Lord. I want you to notice that Barnabas in this moment takes an incredible chance to offer encouragement to Saul. In fact, there were people who were not even wanting Saul to come into the church. They were wondering if his conversion was authentic. Maybe he just made this up so that he could infiltrate our ranks so that he could persecute us and imprison us. Maybe that's what his motives are. Maybe that's really what he's trying to do. But Barnabas whose name means son of encouragement, is an encourager. 
In fact, he comes along, puts his arm around Saul and says, no, guys, disciples, followers of Jesus, I want you to listen. This man's life has been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. He saw the risen Christ on the Damascus road. He has trusted in him as his savior. And he's even preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't shun him in this moment. In fact, I want you to take note of his transformation. I want you to accept him. And so Barnabas, this encourager, comes along and encourages Saul in this season and encourages the believers who are in Jerusalem to receive Saul as one of their own, as a fellow brother in Christ. It says in verse 28, after this warm reception because of Barnabas' encouragement, we see that the third truth, Saul's ministry prospered. Beginning in verse 28, so he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists. Those were the Greek-speaking Jews who were still devoted to the Old Testament and didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. He disputed with them. But they also, the text tells us, were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned of this, they secretly brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. But I want you to notice in verse 31, the church throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and was being built up. And they were walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. The church continued to multiply. One of the great things that we see is that Saul's ministry hinged on these believers in Damascus recognizing this plot against him and sending him out of the city gate wall. And then as he entered back into Jerusalem, it rested on Barnabas coming alongside and being an encourager and promoting that Saul's transformation was authentic. It was real. He really had met Jesus. And Saul's ministry as a result of those two kind acts, those two acts of encouragement, enabled the gospel of Jesus Christ to flourish. In fact, the churches in the area continued to grow more and more believers trusted in Jesus Christ as their Savior. The ministry that Saul began here and that ultimately would spread throughout the world continued to flourish. I want you to notice, though, it came directly tied to the willingness of Barnabas to be an encourager the willingness of the group of believers in Damascus to be an encouragement to Saul and to help save his life. And as we continue to worship here in just a few minutes, I believe that today that same thing is true, that the gospel of Jesus Christ flourishes best in the midst of encouragement. Let's worship together and we'll gather back together and talk some more about how this applies in our lives.
So as we gather back around the word together and think about some applications specifically from the text, how it affects our life and how we can take the truths that we've seen and apply them to our lives personally. I want to just ask this question of you. Would you consider yourself an encourager? Would you think that if someone were to describe you, they would say, oh gosh, they are a son of encouragement or they are a daughter of encouragement? Or maybe they would look and say, eh, you know what? They're really pretty pessimistic. They're kind of a Debbie Downer. They're not really a whole lot of fun to be around or a whole lot of fun to interact with. You know, they always seem like the glass is half empty all the time. You know, it's interesting that we encounter someone like Barnabas and like these other believers who were an encouragement to Saul. And I don't think it's by accident that those are the types of people that encourage Saul. I think for us, as we think about our own lives, my hope and my prayer for myself and for you as well is that we would be described in the same way, that we would be encouragers to other people. You see, I'm absolutely convinced the world has enough naysayers. The world has enough people who are pessimistic and who have a Debbie Downer approach to life. I think what the world needs more of, and especially as believers, more encouragers, people who are willing to put their arms around others and to be an encouragement to them, to say words of encouragement, to be a presence of encouragement as people are struggling and walking through difficulty. And I think even in this season, as difficult as it may be for many people, I think as the church, as believers, we should be the ones who are known to be encouragers. In fact, I think if people call us as believers on the phone, they should absolutely know that they're going to walk away going, gosh, I am glad I had that conversation. I am so encouraged after speaking with them. So as we think about being encouragers, I think a question comes up, why? Why should we be encouragers like Barnabas and like the other believers were to Saul in this text? And I think one of the easy responses to that is we should be encouragers because we know with absolute confidence that our God is in control. So as we look at this situation that we find ourselves in right now with the coronavirus and people losing jobs and income and all of the things that are related to this, you know, the reality is we as believers know that our God is in control. So why should we be encouragers? Why should we be champions? Why should we be the ones who are encouraging other people? Because we know God holds the future in his hands. We know that none of this has caught him off guard. We know that regardless of how dire things may look, that God has a plan and a purpose for our lives and for the lives of other people. And we know that that's all tied in to his Glory. It's tied in to the gospel of Jesus Christ continuing to flourish in this world in which we live. And so for us, we should be encouragers because we know who holds the future in his hands. So we're not sitting back wringing our hands going, oh, I don't know what's going to happen or I'm just going to look as as a pessimist and the glass is always half empty and everything's bad and we kind of function like Eeyore. I don't know if you remember Eeyore and Eeyore's not very happy most of the time. In fact, he's kind of down and everything's just not going well and it's really tough. And I just want to encourage you, don't be an Eeyore. In fact, be an encourager. Be someone who is able to look at the surroundings, able to look at other people and to be an encourager in their lives. We should also be encouragers because We have every reason to be encouraged because of what Christ has done for us. So not only do we know who holds the future in his hands, we are absolutely confident as believers that he holds us in the palm of his hand as well. That because of what Christ has done for us, because of Easter, what we celebrated last week, we have every right to be encouraged personally and then for that to be channeled and help us encourage others as well. 
In fact, for us as believers, we should never look at this world in which we live and think, oh gosh, it's just beyond repair. There's no hope. In fact, for us, we know that there's hope. We know that if people will turn to Jesus Christ as their Savior, they, like us, can be encouraged. They, like us, can be held up in the palm of their Heavenly Father's hand. So we should be encouragers as believers. And then I just want to think for a few minutes, how can we practically be encouraged? So that was the why. Here's why we should be encouragers. But how do we do that? How do we actually take some steps in our daily lives right now to be an encouragement to someone else during this season? Let me just encourage you. Why don't you look around the room in which you're watching this right now and ask the question of yourself, how can I encourage those who are in this room? And maybe you're sitting with your spouse, maybe you're sitting with your kids, uh, maybe you've got extended family that's with you. How can you be an encouragement to them? How can you come along beside them and put your arm around them and encourage them in the same way that Barnabas did Saul in the text? To build them up with your words, to encourage them as they are walking out in obedience. Maybe encourage them to trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. So for you, I want you to just look in your immediate context right now and think, how can I practically encourage my spouse? How can I practically encourage my kids right now? How can they be encouraged in this moment where things are not normal, where things are difficult? How can I encourage them as they are doing school or they are doing work from home or they're going out and tackle grocery shopping or they're going and they're helping a neighbor as they're walking along? But how can I be an encouragement right here? And then I want to help you think as well, how can I be encouragement to the people that are around me, maybe in my neighborhood or in my workplace? I mean, how can you encourage your neighbors? How can you encourage the people that you are working with? You know, oftentimes it's just a simple word. It's just a simple phrase to them, just to say to them, hey, I was just thinking about you and I, you were working extremely hard through this season. I just wanna say thank you as your fellow coworker, thank you for doing what you do so well. Or maybe to a neighbor. I mean, something as simple as, just encouraging them about their yard looking great. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but everybody's yard right now looks good. You know, you can't show up at church, but you can go to Home Depot and get some mulch and get some blades for your lawnmower. And everybody's yard looks really, really good right now. Maybe you can just encourage your neighbor with that. Maybe you can encourage them with something else at this season. Maybe encourage them to trust Jesus as their Savior. Maybe the door is open for you to do that. But I want you to think about how can you take some practical steps this coming week to be an encourager in someone else's life, those close to you, those far away. Maybe for you, you need to pick up the phone and you need to call someone. Maybe you need to call a friend that you haven't talked to in a long time, or maybe you need to call a parent, or maybe you need to call a mentor that's impacted your life, and you just need to say to them, hey, I just, I want to encourage you right now, and just to say thank you for the investment that you've made into my life. I want to encourage you this week to be an encouragement to someone else to live out what we see Barnabas living out in the text today. And you say, Michael, how much impact is that going to have? Maybe I can't see that right now. I just want you to notice that Barnabas' encouragement to Saul in this particular season opened the door wide for the gospel of Jesus Christ to flood the known world over the next year's ahead in Saul, who would later become the Apostle Paul in his ministry. So you can tie his impact, the incredible difference that he made, the thousands and thousands of people who came to faith in Jesus Christ, the churches that were planted, 
the believers who were encouraged, the peace, as we saw the text say, that flooded in the church in these geographic areas. You could tie all of that, I believe, to Barnabas and his encouragement for Saul in this season when others were wondering, is he for real? Is he authentic? Is his salvation true? Just imagine what may happen as a result of you taking on the challenge of being an encourager for someone else or for many other people in this season. Listen, there are plenty Debbie Downers out there. You can turn on the news and find that out really quickly. There are plenty of people who are pessimistic in this season. There are plenty of people who are looking and saying that the glass is half empty. But I want you to remember, we have a reason to be an encourager, and we have opportunities to be an encourager. And the question is up to us, will we allow the Lord to use us to be an encouragement to someone else during this season. My hope and my prayer is that we will hear stories of you being an encourager in someone else's life. You never know what a simple word, a simple phone call, a note in the mail could mean in someone else's life and in the life of the kingdom of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that we're able to see firsthand how much encouragement matters in the kingdom of God. And I thank you for Barnabas's example right now that we have been able to see his encouragement in Saul's life. And I want to ask you, Lord, to help us as your church, as believers, to be an encouragement in someone else's life over this coming week. Help us, whether it's through a phone call or whether it's through text message or a note that we send in the mail or a Facebook messenger, whatever it is, help us to take on this opportunity to encourage someone else. Encourage someone else in their walk with the Lord. Encourage someone else to take that step of trusting Jesus as their Savior. Encourage our kids as they're working hard in school. Encourage our spouse as they're working from home and doing what you've called them to do. God, help us to be the encouragers that you've called us to be and help us to see incredible fruit from taking on that role and fulfilling it as you enable us to do it. We ask this in Jesus' name.
Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. We encourage you to stay connected with our social media channels throughout the week. Be safe and well, and have a wonderful week.